Uh, the, next, the next topic that we have is, I mentioned that yesterday already, is a little bit of a novel story for, for Purple and the foundation, where we're trying to be more product focused and also bring more um, requirements uh, into that. And it is a, um, an effort that deals with lifecycle management. I'm not going to uh, take too much away, but it is the first product working group that we have in Purple. So I'm quite happy that um, we got Joao here from, from Vodafone, who's going to um, go into the details where the project comes from. Um, and where it's, where it's headed over the next 12 months. So please welcome Joao to the stage here. Thanks, Mirko. If you just click forward here. OK. OK, so uh, for, for, the, for the people who don't know me, my name is uh, Jean Freitas. Basically, uh, I work for Vodafone Group as uh, an architect. Uh, in the fixed devices domain in a team-based Germany. And uh, before I, I, I start my presentation, I would like to, to thank this audience for being here and also for being very active. I think one of the reasons why it makes this kind of events very successful is uh, being here in a very open way and asking questions. Because one of the messages that I would like to say is don't be afraid to ask questions. If you feel there's something that um, you don't understand, if you have a different opinion about anything, it's very, very important uh, that you open up and raise it. Because being in a community and being open is just not about uh, doing documentation, make all the information available. Naturally, that's important. But more than that, it's, uh, it's actually about having a voice and, and sharing your input. So uh, <coughs> before I, I jump into the actual agenda, uh, I just want to apologize if I need to pause and on off, just to cough. I'm not at my best days today. Um, so uh, Purple uh, LCM is actually, or LCM as lifecycle management, is actually a, a topic that has been brought uh, already in this, in this conference before. Uh, if my memory does not fail me, we had a presentation two years ago from Technicolor where they tried to talk about uh, what they were doing. Uh, last year, we had a presentation from Stettel, which is a company working with, uh, with a Vodafone, where they, demoed, um, uh, where they demoed for a, a smart home preposition where I, if, I don't, if I don't, I'm not mistaken, we actually showed the light bulb coming here, but this year, uh, I actually want to, um, to talk from a more business side perspective, why these things are important and what can we expect with, with this kind of initiatives and why working as a community is important. So uh, in order to do so, um, what I have for the agenda today is um, I'd like to spend a couple of of time talking about customers' perspective, uh, how, how the customer sees uh, the internet today and the router, uh, if we can do anything uh, in order to change that, because uh, sometimes doing life cycle management is not just about technolo technology change, it's also about how the customer sees us and if he can trust us to provide more, more services on top. Then I will uh, talk about uh, some opportunities for source services because this is a question that we get asked a lot. Okay, uh, we want to develop services, but what are we talking about? And I think that's uh, a very valid and important question that we need to, to, to start talking uh, more often. Then I'll move into talking uh, what firmware management looks like as of today and if there's anything that we can do in order to change that. I will also spend a couple of minutes talking about uh, where we are as, as, in, the, as in the industry. Uh, what are the things that we can do to, to, to improve? Because that was also one of the topics that we heard yesterday. So uh, we are doing a lot of things, but uh, sometimes we, we can do better. We, we can find more ways of op optimizing the work. Uh, and then finally, I'll talk uh, how we see Purple Foundation as an engine for, uh, for doing this kind of work. 
what we expect to, to, to see Purple doing because that's a, a question that Mirko and other people were actually raising and I think we need to answer that uh, to get a bit more direction on the actual work that we are doing, how we can actually get involved or I see a lot of members here, I think it's also important for you to understand how you can become part of these initiatives. And finally, I'll have a little time for, uh, for, for some questions and answers. So if, if there's really anything that you don't understand, I mean, feel free to, to raise it, we can talk about it. Uh, so having that said, uh, first things first, um, if we look at um, how customer sees the internet or the service providers or what they expect from, from the service, uh, you will see a trend that's actually everywhere, which is uh, they want more every year. So if we are talking about internet, they want more speed, they want better latency. And, and why, why, why does this happen? Well, first of all, there are obviously uh, technological advancements, right? We don't watch a uh, standard video these days. We, we talk about HD, full HD, ultra HD, and j it, just, it just keeps evolving. What was good enough yesterday is no longer good enough tomorrow. So that's, that's how humans behave, and this is something we will, ne we will never get rid of. There will always be something else that we can do. So we know this is here, and uh, we shouldn't try to fight to fight back. We should really try to see how we can actually deliver. Because if we understand what our, our customers want, then we can uh, keep on having a healthy business. But on the other side of the spectrum, uh, we also have um, an arrow going down, which is price. So right, uh, it's when when somebody gets used to to, to a service like the internet, you just use it on a daily basis. It just becomes something natural, like drinking water. So people actually take these things from granted and they say, hey, this is important, but they don't realize all what's happening before, uh, behind the scenes, and they, they just want it for free. They, they, they want to, there are even people who think this, everybody should have a, a, a internet access for free, and this is, uh, actually where the problems start to come in because in order to improve the service, we need to buy new technology, we need to, to invest. Um, and on top of that, if we need to decrease the prices, how can we, we make a living out of this? How can we actually make some revenue change? So I think this puts us in a position where uh, we have essentially two options and uh, I actually realize you cannot see the arrows, but um, it, the only thing that I wanted to say is that we can continue to work in this uh, upper side of the picture where we are just a connectivity service or a connectivity gateway. And if we do that, we know how the story ends. We just go back to the loop. Next year, they will demand more. They will expect cheaper. And this is not sustainable. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, we can try to become a bit more. We can try to offer applications gateways. We can try to, to solve more problems that the customer has. And then we can start to think of generating new revenue sheets. So I think that was already enough uh, as, as a presentation about customer expectations. But I just wanted to do a quick analogy to, um, uh, to also routers and to actually um, how Customers also see the, the service from a technology point of view. And I think the best way to do this is if you would try to explain a, a kid how the internet works. I think one, one explanation that I hear often is um, the internet is pretty much works like a post service, right? When you open a web page and you type google.com or purple, uh, .org. Basically, what we are doing is you're sending a message, tell me, I want to see the contents of this website, and then you get it back. But why I'm actually talking about this? The reason why I'm talking about this is because when you look at what Amazon is doing with the delivery center, um, it's actually something similar, which is uh, they are selling things that people were already buying before, but yet they are delivering. And every, each time people want to, to receive the items faster, 
Before we could wait, afford to wait one week, now people don't even want to wait two days. It needs to happen right away. And on top of that, they don't want to pay for it. They, they, want, it, they want it for free. So I think this, like I said, puts us in a situation, but the good thing is that the router is actually the distribution center, which means that uh, if we don't provide a stable service, uh, the customer will not be uh, happy. And that's a very str strategic positioning to be because then the customer can see us as being valuable. But having that said, um, if the router and we service providers are just a distribution center, what can we actually do about services? So in order to answer that question, I would like to refer to our peers in the mobile space and I would like to, to remember us that smartphones weren't always smart. If we look back in the days, uh, this was a device that pretty much we were using to send messages. Then we were doing voice calls. Suddenly, uh, we had basic internet connectivity and we could see some, uh, some ba basic uh, websites in a text format. Then we started uh, taking photos, we started recording video, we started having emails, then it became a GPS, then it became uh, a music player, and so on. It, it just keeps happening. And why, is this, why this, did this happen for mobile devices? I think it happened essentially for two reasons. One is because there was new technology coming in, so it's natural that you, you can leverage that to do more stuff. Uh, on the other side of the spectrum, what we are starting to see is the customer had more devices and uh, they wanted to start consolidating those, right? I, I still remember when I was a kid, I, I wasn't very fond of having a mobile device and having my MP3 player and having another camera. It's just too much burden to carry all this stuff. So I think the reason why this happens is because this also started consolidating multiple devices and the device that actually uh, took all that logic was the smartphone, why? because the smartphone was actually the connectivity device. So having that said, I want to ask us if it's possible to actually do something similar for, for the fixed uh, devices domain, because this is the question that uh, we need to answer. So uh, again, looking a bit on the, on the history of the, the gateway, so back then um, we just had modems, right? we could only connect one device and, and have internet connectivity. And sometimes we would even have to buy special hardware to have that connectivity. Later on, this modem also started to embedding a switch and one device became two. We could connect multiple devices, then it was Wi-Fi. This device became free. And, and now we also have IoT. We are starting to see some gateways where the gateway actually becomes the, the smart home hub. So you start, to, if you start to see the gateway actually absorbing more devices and, and becoming as one, because there is a value uh, in doing that. But if you look also from a, a service perspective, because that's the, the question, do we actually have service on the gateway? And the answer is yes, there are services out there today. The difference is they are non-monetized. So we have guest networks, which solves uh, a problem that actually most of us has, which is uh, I have uh, my internet, I have all my devices connected at home, maybe I have my security cameras, maybe I have my backup server, and so on. Um, and I don't want to open up uh, all and expose all my information to somebody who is just a guest. The only thing that I want to do is actually provide some connectivity or maybe I don't want to have a performance impact. So that's actually a service. Then we have other little features such as file sharing, printer sharing, boost device, and, and so on. Well, mobile backup, it's arguably a monetizable uh, service uh, because you actually have to pay for, for a SIM card. But the point I'm trying to make is there are some services already on the device, and the bottom is that because they are already embedded in the firmware, the customer doesn't even perceive them uh, as being a device. I still remember when I had my first iPhone. It was a very good phone, I really liked it, but 
I had to install an app to actually import my, my contacts from the SIM card. Can you imagine having a service to doing that today? No, because that's a feature that's already there. So that's what I'm trying to say. There's also, this is also a matter of prospection, of having a, a, a way of telling the customers that they can opt in and out of service. And I think that's, that's something important to do. Um, but what can we actually monetize on that? Because we, do, we, ju we don't just want to build services without actually creating new revenue because that's a lot of effort and we are not helping the business uh, grow. So I think there are actually some answers out there when we look at third party developers. Uh, but essentially I've, what we need to do is look into uh, the problems that the customer have and try to solve them. Because that's essentially, essentially how you do business. You need to solve problems that exist. You don't need to make up things uh, and then you don't know if you're going to be sell them, selling them or not. So having that said, smart Wi-Fi is actually a, a very good example. Smart Wi-Fi is probably uh, the biggest reason why uh, customers complain. And they are, uh, you start to see that they are actually starting to, to, to pay more for, for having better Wi-Fi, it could be in the form of buying new hardware like an extender or so on, or you can even be paying an extra fee with a service provider that you have uh, more pods or you actually have a smarter decision making. So there's actually a, a business case out there. Another, another example is naturally parental controls, which is um, something that we, we already had in the past for, for some time. Uh, but it was a bit primitive. Today we are actually starting to see uh, a bit more like content filtering, which is actually a real service. You need to constantly update your databases. You need to know exactly uh, which websites are, are gamings, which ones are social networks, and so on. So there's, it's, it's actually a, a service that you can provide. On the other side of the spectrum, you also have smart homes, right? Um, if, if you look at, uh, I think the smart home is actually an interesting use case because um, a lot of people um, already have smart devices, but there's this entry barrier, right? If you want to have um, maybe a light bulb with Zigbee, you need to buy this extra and ex extra caps. Sometimes it costs 100 euros, sometimes it can be a bit cheaper, sometimes it can be more expensive. But the point is I'm trying to make is once you have this entry barrier, some customers are not opting in. So the, the residential gateway, which is the device that actually provides a con connectivity, if, if it embeds those interfaces, it can actually um, be, be a, a good opportunity to, to help expand the IoT and sell more devices. Philips Hue is already doing this. So they actually have new light bulbs where you don't need to, to buy the Zigbee bridge. You can connect with your Bluetooth device because they see that they need to, to, to break this barrier and we have the opportunity to do that. Um, then we have, for example, dynamic OS, right? And here, uh, I could be talking about two different use cases. There is the scenario where the device can actually uh, prioritize one specific device with some different kinds of techniques like shaping and so on. But there's also with the power of software defined networks, you can actually have an end to end QoS and that could be uh, a sellable product as well. So basic scenario could be um, you have somebody uh, using your internet and you are doing home office and you don't want to have your services being disrupted. So there's a market there. Another one is, for example, network scanners or security propositions. So I actually had, um, have a friend who um, has a lot of IoT devices at home and he asked me, okay, so I, I start having all these Alexas, Google Homes and, and so on at home, but how do we actually make sure that um, somebody is not hacking into my system and, and breaking my things. And I think, again, the gateway can actually be a way for shielding these, uh, these devices. So there's actually a, a real problem that customers heard that we can try uh, to solve as being this distribution center. 
the last example that I wanted to share today is pri about privacy, right? Uh, with all these social networks, all these things happening around, we have a lot of people uh, concerned about privacy. Uh, so VPNs are actually becoming one service which is getting more and more popular. And sometimes it's not just possible to install it on your laptop. There are devices out there that you cannot install apps. Like for example, uh, if you have um, a Wi-Fi light bulb, you cannot just install a VPN there. But if you, if you embedded this functionality in your home router, you can actually protect the whole network in one go without all this software. So, and there, I could actually talk about more use cases, but I think this is already a, a, a good starting point. So, uh, uh, having that said, I, I, I think we should consider if we should start renaming our devices to actually smart routers. And we actually had the previous presentation, we had the smart OS. I think that <laughs> blends uh, quite well. And the reason for that is smartphones did it, and it's only when they did it that they could actually sell cheap, uh, more expensive device. Apple and Google could not afford to sell devices for 1K euros or US dollars uh, if they were not adding, if they were not smart in the first place, right? So in the fixed domain space, we cannot sell more if we don't add more services. So we also need to start changing the customer perspective, how he sees the service provider and how he sees the router. And this is where I, I challenge the industry to also consider uh, calling the devices as smart routers as opposed to just being uh, routers. But are we prepared from a technology uh, point of view? Um, I think this is um, where things start to get a bit more complicated. If you want to introduce a new feature today, um, you need to um, obviously develop that, put effort in doing it. Afterwards, you need to create a new firmware lease New, that leads to a new testing cycle, field trials, because you want to really make sure that you are not breaking anything, you are not disrupting the, the customer experience. And all these cycles actually lead to a poor time to market, which actually means the customer is not very happy because he needs to wait. And we know how the new generations are actually including my own generation. We, we want things right away. We don't want to wait one, one year. If we don't do it fast, they will just be, look for, for, for a different place to be. Uh, but even if we solve this time to market problem, um, each customer is still different. So we cannot really afford uh, to uh, adding all services and functionalities and putting them in, into a firmware. Imagine going to your smartphone, no matter how expensive it is, and downloading or installing your whole, your, all your applications that are available out there. It doesn't work. There's not enough, there are not enough resources. So you need a way to actually opt in and out of these uh, functionalities without naturally uh, breaking down, uh, disrupting the service. So um, what can we actually do about this? So, um, uh, I think this slide is more a, a summary of pretty much what I said before. So right now we have this uh, ble big black box which is, contains everything and in, depending on the business model of service providers, sometimes it's not even well understood what's, what's inside it. Um, and I think we, we need to move into what I've included in the right side of the picture which is um, we separate the middleware, which is the basic and core functionality, and have this set of depo deployable independent manageable units. And I've added this little box around them just to express the need to, to contain them in a way that if something goes wrong, it does not disrupt your service. So imagine if every time you open YouTube on your smartphone, your smartphone would reboot or crash. Would you have it there in the first place? Probably not. And the same applies to any other uh, application. So we need to, to, to do it in a dynamic way and we also need to make sure we don't break the device. Uh, where are we actually if, if in terms of market solutions? So today I would say that we have uh, a set of proprietary solutions 
and some of them are actually open source, but open source doesn't actually make it a standard, doesn't actually make it usable. And no matter which approach you have, you still have common problems out there. You, have, you don't have common set of APIs. You don't have um, the same dependencies or integration processes, which means that uh, if a service provider has different, relies to different implementations, because that's, that's pretty much what happens uh, today in, in, in many cases, uh, we still need to have this burden of doing the same thing in different ways, and that just creates a lot of pressure on us. It's, it's not a very efficient way uh, of working. Uh, so there are a couple of problems here, and I, w I prefer, actually, pref actually prefer to call them opportunities that we can work to get into solve, and I think purple can actually be a, a good place to do so. Why? Because yesterday we actually had discussions about defining APIs, defining specification, that sometimes uh, we need to fail fast and we need to make sure that uh, the development team is also contributing feedback to it. And here at Purple we have carriers, we have ga uh, gateway manufacturers, we have silicon vendors, so we have all the, all the people that we need to, to make sure that we can do it in a way that, that, that actually uh, works. Okay, and Mirku uh, also made an important question, raised an important question yesterday, which is, what do we expect from, from Purple? Um, personally, and also uh, talking from a Vodafone perspective, we would like uh, Purple to translate all I'm saying into a set of deliverables or, or work items and do it in a way which is open. And like I said at the start of this presentation, being open is just not about um, creating documentation, putting out there, making sure it's accessible, is actually giving voice to people and having, being able uh, to, to contribute back. Because this is something that I see uh, in a lot of industries, a lot of communities, many times we see standardization and community efforts as a way to, I go to the community and I expect the work to be already done, so I just take it. But no, that's not how we actually work. You need to go there and, and also voice out your concerns. And the good about this is you have a voice. You can actually have, you are actually empowered to change and shape the future. And that's a big, and that's a big win of being here at Purple. So uh, basically we have four items, which is we'd like to see open requirements, uh, open specification, reference implementation, and a certification test suit. And I'm going to go through one by one, so uh, not trying to, to rush on those, on those ones. So requirements, why do we need them? So there are a couple of reasons, but uh, in order to summarize this in a couple of words, essentially what we want to achieve is uh, we want to make sure that at least there's a common set of functionality provided, right? Uh, sometimes we have business models and, and some historical reasons that we need to work with different suppliers. Um, and, and that means that uh, we need to make sure that uh, there's space for differentiation uh, but there's also a set of or reusable functionalities that we meet, need to make sure that they are there, right? If we are talking about LCM, uh, there are a couple of items that we have, but just a very basic example. If we, if we define that it's important uh, to have a feature like backup, the configuration, we need to make sure that there's a common set of imp implementations uh, that do this. And we need to do this in, all, in the form of open requirements so that we also shortcut these discussions with vendors where we say, hey, this is missing, that is missing. If we do it this in an open way, you know up front what we need and the whole process gets actually simplified. But then we also have the question which is, where do we draw uh, the line? I don't think uh, I'm in a position that I can answer that question today, but I think there are at least uh, three main areas from an LCM perspective that we can already start looking at. I think we can 
define a minimal set of, of use cases or features that we like to have. I think it's also important to include some security constraints in order to avoid breaking the device. And naturally, uh, there's also some value in the pack packaging format. And I'll briefly talk about that. So uh, um, quick, quick run on this slide. So from a feature set, I think there are essentially three, three things. From a service, what we want to do is actually pretty simple. We want to download and install uh, new, uh, new services. Why do we want to do this? Because we want to extend the capabilities that we offer to devices, and we want to do it in a dynamic way. Uh, secondly, we also need to be able to update them. Why? It could be a security patch. It could be a new feature that we introduce. And the reason why it's important to do it uh, independently for, from the firmware release is from a time to market perspective, right? If, 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 there's a, if you have a, an update in one, I don't know, if you're a smart home proposition or web GUI, why should you wait for five months to do that if you can do that right away? There's, there's really no, no reason. And naturally, there's the complementary um, feature, which is removing services, because we also want to make sure that we run our devices in an efficient way. So if there are features that are not being used, we want to be able to remove them so that we can free space. And, and, and having that said, uh, I, I, I've included some services uh, in, in the initial of the presentation. I talked about, for example, file sharing. I talked about uh, uh, printer sharing. But if you look at these services, these are functionalities that most of our devices have. But how many customers are actually using them? They are probably not even aware. I'm seeing from the audience zero. So why do we actually have them consuming memory there in the first place? So if we have LCM, we can actually remove them and free up resources to, to add new capabilities. So I think that's a, a very important use case that we have out there. Then there's actually a configuration, right? We want to also be able to backup and restore the configuration. Why? It could be that the customer does a factory reset to device and we don't want to give them that burden of having to remind the, I don't know, the, the passwords or the IP address of the device or the host name. We want to be able, to, we want to give him the opportunity to recover that configuration, which he probably even doesn't remember. And, and, and we also want to make sure that if for some reason a device breaks or if, if we upgrade him to a new device, we can make sure that um, we can move that away with a new device. So I see that a lot of people stick with the same I, with the same operating system on the smartphone devices because it's so simple to migrate. Um, it's not my intention to to promote Apple on this presentation, but one of actually reasons why I, I, I stuck to that is because I actually have photos or messages from the first phone that I have. I can actually migrate this on and off, and we can do the same here as well. Uh, the last use case that I have about services is also about troubleshooting. Uh, troubleshooting is essential for uh, providing a good customer smart. We had Mike and other people here yesterday talking about telemetry and so on. We need to have a, a way of understanding what's happening with the, with the device, and we also need to do it in a, in a dynamic way. Okay, talking about constraints. Um, why do we need constraints? So essentially, uh, we want to avoid uh, adding capabilities while having the gateway to, to reboot the device. Uh, we don't want uh, to, to also increase the response times of the device. If you look, for example, at statistics about web browsing, 25% uh, of the users, if I'm not mistaken, uh, if the web page uh, takes more than four seconds to load, 25% opt out. They just get frustrated. They don't want uh, to do it anymore. And that's actually one problem that we can have. Enforcing security constraints is just not about preventing reboots, crashes, errors. It's also about making sure that the performance actually remains uh, compatible with the user's uh, expectations. So in order to do so, uh, I think we have a couple of uh, points here. We need to have some sort of system-related resources like CPU, either in the form of CPU caps, prioritization, whatsoever. There can be different flavors. We need to, 
to be able to have memory. We have a lot of technical people here as well, and I think already a lot of people already heard about memory leaks. This, this is something that affects everybody. We need to prevent those. Uh, we also have storage conflicts, and naturally, uh, something that I don't hear people talking that often, but this can actually be important, is we also don't want uh, some services to consume too much bandwidth, right? Because sometimes there are bugs out there and you don't want maybe you have a smart home device there and you have a poor link. You don't want that, uh, that device to just consume your whole bandwidth because you have on the device. You also need to have a way to, to make sure it doesn't, it doesn't disrupt that. And lastly, and, and very important as well, is APIs. The moment we open up, we have this concept of downloadable components. We cannot just uh, open up all the APIs available on the gateway. We need clear defined APIs and we need to make sure that a specific a service can only access the required resources. Coming back to the smartphones world again, everybody sees this concept where you open you install one app and then it needs access to the camera. It's not accessing to the camera without the user consentment. So I'm not saying we need to have exactly the same uh, concept, but we need to have a way of specifically telling this app can only access A, B, and C. Otherwise, it's not possible to make it secure. Uh, packaging. So um, what, actually, what is actually included into a package? We, Naturally, we need to have the, the service, which are the binaries, the functionality that we are extending. Uh, we need, it's arguable if we need to add also the dependencies or at least have some sort of mechanism that if a dependency is not there, there it, it, can, it can depend on a different downloadable component, but there needs to be something to, to, to manage this. Naturally, there's, there's also the need to include some configurations. Why? Because uh, the, it's actually possible to change how a, a service behaves without changing the source code. We can also change the configuration and make some, some behavioral changes on the fly. And that's, that's, it's also important to have that, that flexibility there. And lastly, there, there are naturally the, the constraints, right? Because you will not know the constraints up front, right? You have your framework there, you have your but you, dev you develop your services uh, afterwards, so how can the gateway know up front uh, that it needs, it requires only 5% CPU and it requires access to APIs, ABC? No, you need to do this. Thank you. I think this is uh, actually telling me to speed up the presentation. <laughs> um, no, but we, we still have time. So, um, yeah, I mean, having that said, I think there's an opportunity to, to, to also uh, try to standardize and harmonize this a bit because if we don't do so and we have different Better. implementations, uh, then for a service provider, it becomes really difficult to manage the service, right? Uh, if I have the same service with uh, similar constraints, I don't want those constraints to depend on the technology. I want to make sure that they are abstractable, right? In, and I think this is uh, possible because if you look, for example, some technological use cases such as Wi-Fi, right? We have Wi-Fi, B, G, N, A, C, A, X. There are always new things coming in. But there are the APIs from a customer perspective don't, don't necessarily change much, right? They still change the, the, SSI, the network SSID. They still change the, the, the Wi-Fi password. And it's the same with the multi-access points network. So it doesn't matter if the device has one Wi-Fi node, two device nodes, three. He still does the same operations, and we need it. So I, f I really think it's possible to, regardless of which uh, technologies we use, to, to have some sort of harmonization on those things, because the technology is just a means to to uh, to an end. Okay, about specifications. So I think one of the things that carriers providers. Um, learn the hard way is that integration, especially now that we have third-party developers, is not easy. 
uh, a lot of uh, projects efforts seem to be very underestimated. And one of the things, I think this picture with a puzzle really describes the problem that we, we have here. We don't want to spend one year, two years uh, picking up all the little pieces and suddenly we find out there's one small little piece and it doesn't fit <laughs> anywhere. That, that's a big problem, that's a situation you don't want, want to be in. So having that said, the message that I want to convey with, uh, with specifications is that sometimes the requirements are not sufficient in order to explain what we need. It's also, there's also a value in having some implementation guidelines because the same service, the same functionality can actually be integrated in different ways. And this picture actually illust illustrates to use cases. It's, it's possible to have a service that binds directly to, to the IPC bus if you have rich enough APIs, and that's, I think that's a good way of doing it because then you can enforce access controls and, and, and you can have some error, error handling and so on. You, don't, you do it in, without getting too deep into the integration. Uh, another way of doing it is going through configuration files, and sometimes this happens because the APIs that we have are not rich enough, and while this can work, this can be problematic. Why? Because the moment you start messing around with configuration files, there's no validation on what you are doing, right? It's just a text file. You, you can e actually, for having, uh, giving one example, you have a Wi-Fi channel, right? From a text file perspective, uh, Wi-Fi channel can be like 1, 6, 11, but you can actually write your name there. There's nothing telling you that's wrong. And if you grant this kind of access, when the Wi-Fi manager boots in, it will not work because it's not a valid channel. And on top of that, there are no access controls being enforced. There. So we need to be careful with these things. Another use case that we actually sometimes come across is deep integrations that go uh, to drivers. And while it's true that sometimes there is need to go deep, sometimes there isn't really a need. I've, I've seen implementations that go to the driver just to check the, the Wi-Fi SSID. And the reason uh, why sometimes I, I came across is because I, I actually heard this personally was, you know what, um, if I need to integrate with the uh, IPC level, I have too many APIs out there. It's just too much work for me. So that's why we need to put some effort in standardizing this. Well, if I do it at the driver level, there are probably two or three drivers which are popular. It's less effort for me. Okay, maybe it's less effort from who is developing service, but this creates a lot of problems for service providers. And it also creates a lot of unexpected results. I've, I've seen uh, implementations that they start messing around with the driver and suddenly all their services start showing up information which is not consistent with what's actually there. So, um, and we are talking about the same functionality. So having a specification really helps us, carriers providers, address this kind of, of issues uh, up front. Um, reference implementation. Why do we need a, a reference implementation? Well, I think we, had, we heard good reasons yesterday why reference implementations can, can help. But personally, I think what we really want is more than a reference implementation. We, what we want actually is having a community uh, implementation. Uh, why? Because while there is value in having reference implementations to, to value if the work uh, you are doing, sometimes we also need to question ourselves if, if, if that's actually the, the problem that we have. Sometimes the problem that we have is much more simpler. It's just because we are not putting enough effort in actually defining the specifications. And here talking, uh, I'm not saying that we need to spend one year defining specifications, but we definitely need to take this matter seriously. Look at other industries, for example. You don't go to a construction company, ask them to build a house, and they tell you, you know what, I'm going to build a house to see if it stands, and I build you a second house to see if it works. No. If, if there could be cases uh, that y y you could fail sometimes, but most of the times it's just lack of putting effort in doing in the right way. There's really no reason to fail that much. Uh, at this uh, at this stage, so that's why I'm saying that community implementations uh, is is what we need. Why? And leveraging one of the questions that we had here uh, yesterday is 
okay, if we start working as a community, how can we have an ecosystem that we can all benefit? I think that's a, a very uh, valid question. And I think one of the answers is because we can do better at effort management, right? Uh, we can start offloading the, the vendors and we can start uh, putting this uh, common functionality which is non-differentiating in the form of a community. Clear examples, right? Would you pay, would you, would you sorry, <coughs> would, you, would you pay um, for, a, for a smartphone uh, um, just because it has an app store without any apps? No, the customer will not pay more just because we have an app store, just because we do lifecycle manager. That's just a tool to deliver something. He will pay uh, for, for the services. He will not pay for the concept of an app store. And we are doing all of this uh, already. So why, why do it, why, why take all this effort alone and do the same thing all over together? Why not do it together, share the effort, do it in a smarter way and more optimized way, and leave for the actual services to drive the revenue? I think that's a smarter way uh, of, of, of doing the, the work. Okay. Um, another topic which I think it's, it's, it's very important is also talking about uh, test frameworks and certifications. Here I'm going to ask the question uh, in a reverse way. So why not have a common, uh, uh, why not have a, a, a certification a program and, and a tool? And I think there's a good reason for doing that, which is from the moment that we have common APIs, why do we need different test cases? You just have a common touch point. You can reuse all this effort again. So again, it's a more, it's about optimizing and being smarter at how we, we, uh, we do things together. Um, and if that wasn't a good re reason enough, there's also another um, um, benefit involved here, which is um, resolving bugs early enough, right? Uh, if we see a lot of uh, development efforts right there that you, you create the test case at the same time and you start understanding uh, how things, uh, what is going wrong, right? If you give early feedback uh, to the teams, then you, 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 you start reducing the bugs and in the end you will save, there will be some cost savings there as well. Then there's also the matter of having clear expectations as well. So. Personally, I've already spent a considerable amount of time writing requirements, engaging with different suppliers, and I see two big problems. On one hand, uh, if we write too little, they don't understand what we, we want. On the other hand, if we write too much, they don't read it. So either way, it is a requirement. I mean, obviously, they get the job done, but there's always a gap there, right? There, but there's one thing. Uh, that everybody understands, which is sharing a test report with clear pass and fail test cases. That one always gets the message done. So I think that having a clear certifi uh, certification or test framework really helps also with having, defining what you actually expect, what is actual expected behavior. And this also leads uh, to better time to market. And another important point is wider adoption. On and off, I have discussions with different companies about APIs and different kind of things. And many times, the reason for adopting certain initiatives is because there's already a, a test framework there available. Yes, it's always possible to develop it, but if it's already there, that translates into time to market. It means you do things faster. You know, it's always about how fast you can do things. So, um, uh, as as final thoughts, uh, what I want to say with this uh, presentation is I think LCM and selling services is just not a technological matter. It's about, first of all, changing the customer perspective, how they see us, how, how they see the router. We need to, we need to work uh, on changing this. Uh, we also need to break down the, the life cycle management of the firmware. We cannot afford to release new features in the form of new firmware releases. We need to do this in a deployable, uh, in a dynamic fashion. Thirdly, uh, an enabler is not a differentiator. So I already provided the example why I believe LCM is not a differentiator. It's because it's the same as offering an app store to the customer with no apps. He will not pay you for it. He will not pay for it. 
there's no, no value there. And lastly, if we do this together and we have a common baseline, we will certainly invite external innovation, and this is already happening. So um, having that said, uh, I wanted to encourage everybody to, to, uh, to join, to join Purple, to, to be on the calls, to discuss, share your ideas up front. Don't be idea to also challenge uh, the concepts that we have. I think that can be used in, in, a, in a constructive way. So I actually thought this was going to be a, a short presentation, but it's already 50 minutes long. Uh, but in case you have any questions, I'm happy to, to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. That was, that was, I think, one of the best um, cases for Purple, not only for LCM, but for, for Purple in general. So thank you very, very much for the detail. Before you go, no, 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 I haven't, we have not heard any questions yet. Anyone, any questions? Quite detailed. You answered all the questions. I think that was awesome. So I think I will, um, with permission um, of the membership and of, obviously of you, I think that's, that's a very good uh, Purple 101 presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um,